Okay, uh, so yeah, thanks, Christoph, and uh, I'm very glad to to talk here about uh, a bit about my vision in the next 20 minutes on where we stand in achieving this long-held dream that we've had in the molecular simulation community for a long time to enable fully quantum uh, biomolecular simulation. And uh, uh, in, in the last years, machine learning, as you correctly said, has become a new tool that uh, pushes us much closer to the dream. And really what we are doing, in my view, is sort of interpolating between these uh, giants in our field. So um, essentially uh, our field of molecular simulation stands on the shoulders of these two Nobel Prizes, one awarded to Conan Popol in 98, who uh, enabled essentially um, fully quantum mechanical simulations and uh, another Nobel Prize uh, awarded to Carplus, Levit, and Warshall in 2013 for molecular mechanics approaches. Um, and these approaches, of course, uh, provide uh, an, an efficient force field parameterization, but they also are based on first principles of statistical mechanics. And so uh, what we hope to do with machine learning is to somehow interpolate between ab initio accurate methods and uh, do so hopefully uh, efficiently enough to run a long time scale molecular dynamics simulation. So we have not yet achieved that goal. This still is a dream, in my opinion. And uh, in 2021, when we wrote this review articles, we were somewhere here. So this is show here, shown here with an arrow. We, we are here in the present, where we can uh, basically simulate small molecules or well-ordered materials, or things even like nucleotides and small peptides. Now, um, the why we can do this really is because most of the machine learning approaches that exist today are biased towards accurately describing chemical bonding. And that's something that force fields, mechanistic force fields could not really achieve in the past. So there have been an, an enormous uh, uh, break, uh, amount of breakthroughs in, in machine learning in developing new representations and new architectures based on kernels and neural networks that essentially enable us to treat short range effects. Let's say up to five to eight angstrom cutoff and uh, in this audience, we have several real experts in this field, like, like Gabor, for example. Uh, but what we have not, or what we have not achieved, and what we are doing at the moment, is trying to push the frontier towards more complex heterogeneous systems. But this is, of course, not only requires new architectures, but it's also required rethinking of what kind of long range effects. We, we need to describe in order to do this complex simulations. And trust me, there are millions of different long range effects. We don't understand many of them yet. Uh, there is long range charge transfer, there is long range electrostatics, there is long range electron correlation and so on and so forth. And at the moment, this is a, a really burgeoning field where different solutions are being proposed and we do not have really settled on the universal solution. Now, to achieve this uh, dream, uh, I'd like to present two different uh, approaches. So we diverge with the aim to eventually converge on some universal solution. So the first uh, um, type of approaches that we have developed uh, in my group together uh, with the group of Klaus Robert Müller are symmetric nonlinear kernels. And I will spend a bit of time um, and, 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 and on this, and uh, the idea here is to provide a systematic pathway from small molecules, that's where we started, towards larger and larger and larger systems. Now, an alternative approach is the neural, what I call the neural network path. Uh, you produce enough data and then you brute force your way. And I will show an approach that we recently actually uh, submitted which is called GEMS, uh, which stands for General Molecular Simulations, that aims to substitute mechanistic classical force fields for biomolecules with uh, first principles based fields. So let me start with the first path. Um, so back in about 2015, uh, we were interested in uh, creating a force field uh, for small molecules with which we could actually carry out explicit bus integral molecular dynamics 
uh, where the electrons are treated at high level quantum mechanics, say couple cluster theory, and the nuclei are treated quantum mechanically as well. So we, we want to quantize both uh, electrons and nuclei. And the uh, question was, well, can we do this for small molecules? Let's say up to 20 atoms in size. That's where we can actually produce a couple cluster reference data as well. Uh, but there are also some additional requirements on, on what we wanted to achieve. First of all, uh, we do not want to impose any cutoffs because quantum mechanics in the end is non-local. So you need all the degrees of freedom. Uh, this approach has to be data efficient, uh, hopefully uh, learning just from hundreds of conformation of a molecule. It has to be accurate. Accurate to us means about 0.2 to 0.3 kcal per mole errors uh, in terms of energy and 1 kcal per mole per angstrom error in forces and have no artifacts uh, when running as integral molecular dynamics simulations. Um, so what we came up with is a, a, a radically different approach to what most people have been using. So uh, in the domain of machine learning, uh, the dominant approach is working in the energy domain. So you propose some energy function, which can be very complicated, for example, a neural network or uh, some uh, highly dimensional descriptor. And, uh, and then you give in energy samples. Of course, you can use force samples as an additional constraint. And uh, then you take... Um, uh, a derivative of this energy function once the parameters are trained to get a force to run molecular dynamics. But you can do also do something uh, inverse. You can actually learn the vector field, so 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 the, the the gradient field that you need to run your molecular dynamics. And then once you train this only based on on force samples, you can integrate it and get a potential energy source. Now, it sounds like this is a bad idea because learning a vector field should be much more complicated than learning a scalar field with a potential energy surface. But in fact, it turned out to be a great idea because the vector field with which we work, with which we work is actually uh, a conservative vector field. And this imposes a lot of constraints on, on the learning problem, which in the end leads to data efficiency. So um, to give you some a general uh, idea of what we do, so we are given uh, a set of conformations, so coordinates of atoms and their forces. This is reference data, which we can compute with density functional theory or couple cluster method for these molecules. Then uh, we write uh, a kernel in the vector, uh, sorry, in the uh, gradient domain. So the covariant structure is provided by Hessian matrix. We use the simplest possible descriptor in this case, the so-called uh, inverse distance matrix or Coulomb matrix. So we don't have to invent a new representation. We use the simplest possible representation. But because we work in the, uh, in the Hessian domain, we actually have all the equivariance information. We have all the directional information because we are computing the Hessian matrix on the simple representation. Um, once uh, we've done that, we can actually obtain the parameters. Uh, uh, we feed the parameters using kernel rich regression on a certain data set of molecular conformations. And uh, we get a, a force kernel. We can integrate it and in the end get an energy kernel, which now constitutes your potential energy surface. So uh, in principle, as I said, there are two different ways to now learn a potential energy surface and a force field, right? So you start from conformations of a molecule like benzene here. Uh, you can then, uh, what we do is we learn in a force domain. So we, we construct an explicit vector field and then by integrating it to get a potential energy surface. Now you can go the other way around. This is the more traditional way you construct an energy uh, model and then you take analytical derivatives to construct a, a force field. Now, in principle, when there is an infinite amount of data uh, uh, for your model, then this a priori approach shown by the red arrows here is equivalent to the a posteriori approach shown by the, by the uh, uh, blue arrows. But under conditions of, of, of practical information where we have finite information about the molecule, a priori is not equal to a posteriori. And in fact, the a priori approach is a much more correct way of doing things because it assumes energy conservation within your reference data, which is something very different than imposing energy conservation on the learned energy function. Now, we have demonstrated for many different molecules that uh, this is an extremely data efficient approach. Uh, essentially, you can get chemical accuracy 
for just hundreds of conformation of a molecule. The largest molecule we've done back in 2018 is aspirin. This is not a very large molecule, but we can actually do this molecule. We can reproduce the force field at the couple cluster level of theory. And we've demonstrated that we can run explicit path integral molecular dynamics of such molecules and obtain agreement with the experiment uh, uh, quite well. Now, of course, we want to go beyond uh, small molecules is, uh, uh, is not all there is. And recently we've uh, actually it took us about three to four years, but recently we've extended the GDML approach uh, uh, to uh, in two different directions. One is we can play a lot of tricks on the kernel matrix that we have. Uh, the kernel matrix uh, has uh, many eigenvalues, which are small, so you can throw away a lot of the uh, eigenvectors. Uh, and that means you can essentially do a preconditioned conjugate gradient solution, and this enables a large scale GDML models. So this was just published uh, a couple of, couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we've demonstrated that we can actually do GDML models, which are global, completely global, right? We have all, the, all possible interactions at all length scales uh, for um, systems with up to 370 atoms. So this double wall nanotube was the largest system we have done. Uh, and we can do larger systems, actually. There are still many more tricks to play. And, and this is nice because this provides a benchmark because this is a fully global model that has no cutoffs, uh, no, no uncontrolled approximation. So, so I think this, this model, GDML model, really uh, you know, sets a, a benchmark. In this paper, we also present a new data set. Uh, we have uh, in the past had this MD17 data set, which is used by many people to, to benchmark uh, um, machine learning force fields for small uh, molecules. Now we've extended this data set to all four types of biomolecular systems, actually biomolecular blocks, and also to nano structure. So uh, the largest system here is, as I said, 370 atoms. So this provides a completely new challenging data set to, to play around. Um, we've also extended GDML for materials. So we can, by including all symmetries, so the periodic boundary conditions, the uh, um, you know all the translational and uh, rotational symmetries in the crystal, and uh, by doing so, we can model two-dimensional materials, diffusion of, uh, of, of atoms in, in solids, and, and so on. Um, just an example of an application we can do, which is leads to very surprising physical results. So this is uh, dynamics of, of benzene molecule on top of periodic graphene. So this is a fully periodic calculation, uh, four by four uh, graphene unit cell. Uh, and uh, something surprising that we realized is uh, if you look at the free energy surface, as a function of two degrees of freedom. The, um, the average height of um, benzene on top of graphene and the rotation angle with respect to the graphene surface. Here, classical molecular dynamics actually yields delocalized benzene over graphene, while pass integral molecular dynamics actually localizes it. And this is surprising because pass integral molecular dynamics is supposed to delocalize things. But of course, by delocalizing uh, carbon hydrogen fluctuations, what you are doing is you're actually increasing the polarizability of benzene and of graphene as well. And by increasing polarizability, the van der Waals interaction between benzene and graphene actually is increasing quite significantly by about 40%. And that makes the system actually stable. Um, so so you, can, you can now see uh, by, by employing the state-of-the-art machine learning force fields that you can obtain uh, novel insights and enable simulations that were unheard of uh, just a few years ago. Now, the important thing is that in this particular simulations, you need both local fluctuations and non-local fluctuations to, to be well treated, right? In the molecule, in the, in the graphene layer, but also between the molecule and, and graphene. And so this is a, a very challenging test system. Okay, now this was our first path towards uh, large molecules. Now, this is not without problems. So in the GDML approach, um, it's usually uh, constrained to one particular system. So you, if you have trained a model of benzene on four by four graphene unit cell, you cannot extend it for benzene on uh, you know, 12 by 12 unit cell. So, so your system is determined by the number of atoms, right? You cannot change the number of atoms easily. They are working on some solutions for that. But this is not. This has not been accomplished yet. Uh, the main challenge is that the model is global, right? So you have all interactions, and the number of atoms is fixed, and you cannot easily change one atom to another atom, and so on. So this is not a transferable approach. Okay. 
Now, to make it transferable, of course, we can play the same game as many other people play in this field is we switch to, to neural networks. Um, now, a state-of-the-art neural network that uh, have been developed recently in the group of uh, uh, Klaus Robert Müller by Oliver Unke is the so-called SpookyNet architecture. It's uh, what is called an equivariant transformer, a neural network, uh, which has attention mechanism, which means it can capture non-local effects. Uh, there are many tricks here. I will not go into detail. I can uh, we can talk about it in, during the question session. But uh, an additional uh, thing about this architecture is that uh, you're not only describing local and non-local interactions, but you also have explicit physical terms for long range electrostatics, uh, for pairwise dispersion and for a repulsive potential, which makes it in principle transferable to, to, to many systems. Um, so we have, um, uh, actually this is really a, a pandemic project. So we started this project in the beginning of, of the pandemic in the first few days uh, where we were under lockdown. And we asked the question, can we um, use such an architecture to actually uh, develop uh, a universal uh, machine learning force fields for biomolecular simulation. And uh, we did this in collaboration with Google Brain, where Klaus uh, Müller was actually uh, doing a sabbatical at the time. Um, so essentially, we created uh, uh, two different types of data sets. So we took uh, several proteins, uh, simple ones like polyalanine, uh, larger ones like crumbin, and also actually SARS-CoV-2 ACE2 interface, right? Because that's what we were really interested in, in simulating. And we created so-called uh, bottom-up fragments. These are the same for all proteins. These are just, you know, amino acids and a bit larger fragments. And then also top-down, long-range fragments, up to 300 atoms. And here we also include water, right? Because we want to simulate, of course, proteins in explicit water. And then we combine this information, right? And this is what we call the GEMS approach for general molecular simulations. So then we feed in this data to uh, a spooky net uh, architecture. And uh, here you can see the reference data, by the way, is computed at the uh, PB0 plus uh, many by dispersion, PB0 plus MBD uh, uh, accuracy. And we have about uh, four uh, to five million structures in total. So, so this was uh, uh, quite some heat generator, and, and this was all really only possible because we had access to Google research infrastructure. So, so this, uh, it's not fun, right? This generated, this, this used about 15% of whole Google research infrastructure actually for a year and a half. Uh, this is a lot of calculations. You wouldn't be able to do this on, on a you know, university computer. Nevertheless, we thought that this is a great project to really show uh, whether by brute forcing, by generating a very large data set, we are able to do novel biomolecular simulation. And so here you see the, um, uh, uh, the comparison of um, accuracy uh, in energy and forces and comparing to a classical mechanistic force field amber. You clearly see that GEMS, uh, so SpookyNet trained on this data, is, is very accurate. Um, uh, but also you can apply now this model to actually do long time scale molecular dynamics. So for example, we did a folding dynamics of polyalanine. We just start from a, from a random coil and we feed it to a helix. And what we see is that the fluctuations of, of, the, of, the, of the polyalanine actually qualitatively different compared to uh, amber force field. Um, in, in GEMS, there is an alternation between alpha and 310 helix, about 60 to 40%, while most force fields just fit rigidly to an alpha helix and stay there. They don't fluctuate out, which means that the quantum mechanical force field is significantly more, uh, more smoother and, and, uh, and flexible than uh, um, it, its classical mechanistic counterpart. We also did simulations of uh, crumbin. Here, we do not do uh, full dynamics because this is still out of the uh, reach of, of current uh, uh, architectures. Um, but we here compare, so we do this in explicit water. Actually, this is the first time where you have full uh, quantum description of, of protein water system, right? We have a huge water box, 25,000 atoms in total. And, and this is trained on, on just quantum mechanical data. Um, so if you look at the, this is an NMR ensemble um, of, 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 of the crumbin uh, um, protein. Here is the amber ensemble, and here is a solution NMR. 
And you can already see visually that the GEMS ensemble is significantly closer to the solution in the mass structure than the Umber FF ensemble, which is significantly more rigid. Now, in order to move to a bit more quantitative um, results, here is the more detailed analysis of the trajectory. So for example, we can compute, um, we can project the trajectory on two relevant degrees of freedom using the UMAP projection. Um, so we, we take a molecular dynamics trajectory using Umber FF or GEMS, we project on just two degrees of freedom, on just two collective degrees of freedom, and we look uh, at how the dynamics evolves in those two degrees of freedom. And you can see that with Umber, the dynamics looks like a random walk, while with GEMS, the dynamics is significantly smoother and in fact resembles a loop. Um, this results do not change if we change the collective coordinates from gems to umber and so on, right? So these results are really uh, quite stable and, and robust with respect to the projection to different collective degrees of freedom. So, so this really means that the dynamics uh, of the protein um, around the native state is qualitatively different in, in gems and in, in umber. The same results apply to charm, by the way, and, and, and other force fields. Um, you can also look now at why this happens. So, so the plot here shows the uh, root mean um, uh, um, structure structure deviation, uh, sorry, uh, RMSD, right, for the geometry starting at zero time, so at the equilibrium state, and as the structure evolves uh, at different time scales. So with Umber, you see that you very quickly deviate from the equilibrium structure at short time scales, and then you stay at you know, essentially uh, the fluctuations converge. While with gems, it's completely different. Uh, you, um, you stay close to, this, to the native structure for much longer time scales, but at very long time scales, you actually deviate much further. So you, you, you explore much more of the potential energy surface at long time scales. Um, um, the same information you get from, from the spectrum, for example, this is a power spectrum, uh, uh, and, and here you see that GEMS reproduces the water peak positions quite well, while uh, uh, Umber FF this uh, TIP 3P water model cannot, cannot do this. So, uh, so there are many examples now, and you're really excited about this, where uh, clearly the difference between classical mechanistic force fields and uh, a force field, a neural network trained on explicit quantum mechanical data give a qualitatively different results. In the paper, uh, it's also an archive actually, I, I forgot to include the, the archive link, but uh, um, we have examples for three different uh, proteins, uh, which demonstrate essentially the same conclusions that the, um, um, the potential energy surface with uh, gems is significantly uh, smoother, and the barriers uh, actually di have different distribution with respect to the umber force field. And so I think it's nice because it, it demonstrates that there is quite some um, um, something to discover uh, when moving uh, to uh, explicit quantum mechanical force fields. And while this dream has not yet been achieved, I think it's it's this the first um, um, you know correct direction to go towards the dream. Okay, um, now of course as well here, right? Uh, there's the neural network approach, there's the gems approach. Uh, it's you know not everything is solved. Uh, there are many uh, things that remain to be done. Uh, for example, uh, we know that the uh, top-down fragments are not transferable between different proteins. So the bottom-up ones are, right, because they are all the same for all proteins, but the top-down ones, for example, you can train a model for polyalanine using crumbing uh, long-range fragments, and you realize that your dynamics changes, uh, and it changes actually significantly, which means that the um, transferability uh, of this approach might not be there. So you might still need to train for different each time for each for, for different proteins. Um, this is something you would like to avoid in the end, right? But uh, um, by having access to this GEMS approach and to the reference data, I think uh, it gives us a lot of interesting things to play with and, and to understand how robust and reliable uh, this uh, neural networks uh, potentials can actually be. Okay, so I hope I've demonstrated to you two divergent pathways in a way to um, come to uh, machinery and force fields for large systems. Uh, I think we are still not there, 
uh, when we can simulate, you know, big proteins or protein-protein complexes or drug-protein interactions. But we are slowly getting there. And I think there is a lot of excitement in the field because of uh, many breakthroughs that have happened in the past years. But there's still a lot that remains to be done. And I think the main challenge is really to um, incorporate uh, physical models uh, for long range interactions uh, with uh, sophisticated machine learning approaches for shorter range effects. Uh, with that, thank you very much.